the first five months this year, uh, every single month I made a million, million a month for my uh, investments, mainly, in, you know, it was meant to be this whole like picture perfect story where this Russian village boy moves to London and my stepfather was very wealthy. I mean, shit, if by the age of five or six, the story ended there, it would have been a picture perfect tale. But, um, you know, very quickly that marriage kind of deteriorated, but things were bearable until I was like 10 or 11. And then it said when he cut us off fully, um, you know, the next five, six years were quite tough. I'm so grateful. Subscribe, do everything you need to do, yeah? Welcome back to the CEO cast, guys. I'm Raheem. Now, welcome back to season three. What a start we have had with the episode of Chrono last week. I hope you all enjoyed that. If you haven't seen it, make sure you go check it out now. Now, today's episode's a completely different one. It's going to be one that when you hear his story, you're going to be very inspired and motivated to get up off your ass right now after the podcast and make a killing for yourself. Today, I'll have you introduce yourself. Well, first of all, Raheem, thank you so much for having me. Uh, we had a nice cigar before this. Yeah. Enjoyed some of the torrential London rain. <laughs> but um, my name is Iman Gadji. I am, I don't know, how, where do I start? Um, entrepreneur. Uh, 21 years old. So uh, I would say, Raheem was like, how do I introduce him? I'm like, well, you can say that I'm the first guest who's still going through puberty. So there's that. Um, <laughs> yeah. Started a few companies. My main one is, uh, I was saying to you, is about as exciting as having an accounting firm. Uh, I run an advertising agency, been doing that for the past five years. And from that has spawned a few other businesses, a software company for agency owners, as well as an education platform for agency owners, um, as well as actually, should have worn them today as we make um i have an e-commerce brand as well and we make these uh, fun little blue light blockers what's that uh, blue light blockers yeah yeah they're um you know when you're on your desk and especially at night so uh, i'm sure you've seen some of the hue lights yeah it's funny because like whenever i have uh, a girl come over to the house you know, all my all the lights in my house uh, turn red like oh, fully red automatically yeah, yeah. at 7 30. get it a bit and, romantic and stuff no and, and girls come in and they're like so why the red lights i'm like you you want the real answer or you, you want the cool answer and like give me the the real answer and i'm like well red is the lowest kelvin on the light spectrum yeah um so it helps in melatonin production so yeah i'm a big like sleep junkie obviously i was mentioning to you at uh at the cigar lounge um one of my sort of first big early clients was a, a company called aura ring yeah um so for the past four years religiously i've been tracking my sleep um in the nine months a year i'm very on point with my sleep in the three months a year that i'm very not on point with my sleep yeah, yeah, yeah. um so yeah, anyways, the blue light blockers, they, they help you, um, you know, especially if you're working before bed, uh, you know, I've got, uh, a flux and I've got all these things on, on my devices, but yeah. nonetheless, I'm very, uh, OCD when it comes to not letting any blue light in before bed. So <laughs> fair enough. Now, um, yeah, so I just want to let people know, I don't usually smoke cigars, but you know what, when Iman invited me for it, I was just <laughs> like, you know what, let's go for it. Now I want to start this podcast off on a powerful note. You said you're very transparent, no holding back on any questions. So I'm going to jump straight to this on a very powerful note so that people know what levels we're working with. Google told me that your net worth is $25 million. Mm -hmm. Is that true? Uh, well, I mean, here's the thing, right? Like, I think net worth's a bit of a BS number. Because mm. um, at the end of the day, usually net, work, uh, net worth also consists of what you could sell your companies for. And, you know, I was mentioning yeah. to you earlier, um, you know, my agency... It can't really be sold in my opinion my education company it couldn't really be sold i guess if you take sort of the multiples you could sell it for i could sell my education company and my agency combined probably around 50 million but no one's going to give me that yeah, right yeah, yeah. Uh, whereas the new agency software obviously the the play with that is to sell it within five years for um you know anywhere from 50 to a few hundred million um i think for me the best sort of uh estimation is to or the most honest answer is, hey, if I had two weeks to sell all my stuff, how much could I have in my bank account? Yeah. Um, and that would be close to around 10. So around 10 million, yeah. Not as impressive. It's still very impressive, <laughs> considering you're only how old? Because I don't think you mentioned that in your introduction. Yeah, uh, 21. 21 years old, mm. and you could be worth 10 million in two weeks' time if you sold everything. Mm. I'm pretty much packed up. It's okay. Yeah. <laughs> we'll get to the pack up bit in later on because you're actually moving to the buy in about a week or two. In the most literal sense, yeah. <laughs> yeah, literally, yeah. So uh, we'll get to that later on. But I want to start with like mm. where this all started for people who follow your YouTube journey, 
mm. they might know. But for people who are, you know, average followers of CEO cast, they might mm. actually not know mm. who you are, what you do. So mm. like you mentioned, you've got four businesses. Mm -hmm. Mentioned software, education and the agency. Mm -hmm. What's the other one? Uh, the e-commerce brand. Oh, yeah, the e-commerce e brand. Yeah. yeah. So for the people who don't understand what an agency is, mm -hmm. what is it you're referring to and what is it exactly do for your clients? Yeah. So basically... What we do at my agency is uh, we work with large e-commerce brands and education companies and sort of our philosophy is pretty simple. 90% of our revenue uh, comes in from performance. So, you know, we'll have clients coming to us, you know, already used to spending 100K a month, bringing back in 250K a month and they want to get to a million a month. Yeah. So in instances like that, we'll take a small base, uh, we'll take a small base fee. And then um, what we do these days is if historically they have a track record of bringing back hundred K or let's say historically they have a track record of bring in 150 K a month. Yeah. Um, return on ad spend. Then we'll go the first 150 K we make you, you've already done that yourself. Like we don't need to take a cut of that. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. So we'll take a little 20% margin of safety. So we'll say the first 120 we make you is, is on us. Um, and then from there we'll take anywhere from on the low end, 2% on the high end, especially if it's some education companies where, you know, there's no, um, cost of goods sold um we'll take sometimes even up to 15 20 percent but it's usually for e-commerce business anywhere from two to five percent yeah of whatever we make them on ads minus the ad spend um so yeah i mean with some of our clients we've got you know some of our clients we make them a million a month return on ad spend and you know if you're even taking two three percent of that and you have a few you know you've got 10 15 clients it starts to starts to add up so so what's your monthly income look like um, well, as I was mentioning to you this year, it's been a little, this year it's been a little skewed. Um, and because I've got these various businesses, so we've got something like Gradiency where, um, you know, we were talking about how it's at the end of the day, it's a real, it's a business that is fulfilling to me. And it's something that gets me excited. Like, I'll be honest, and I've said this for years and I was, you know, I'll say this even to my clients, like my agency is not something where I'll be on my deathbed and I'm like, I'm so grateful that I've managed to build literally the most boring business on earth. But what that business allows me to do is it allows me the free cash flow to then invest. And basically my agency is a thing that kind of pays for my lifestyle. Yeah. Um, it's a pays for my lifestyle and allows me to put that into investments. Uh, the education company will make a lot of money very soon, but I've put a lot of money into R and D. We just built a custom platform. So, you know, um, custom platform, custom community, custom tools. Uh, so that costs a lot of money over the last year and a half. Um, so I said, each business kind of has a different purpose, but usually on any month, it'll be anywhere from a hundred to 300 K a month profit. Um, but as I said, this year has been a little skewed because as I said, I had a lot of cash over the last few years. I mean, I'm obviously I'm very young, but, uh, you know, I've been running my business for five years. Yeah. Um, so I had a good few million and kind of stockpiled and, uh, in the last year or so I went very heavy on investments and, um, it's a little less now, but uh, the first five months this year, uh, every single month, I made a million, million a month for my uh, investments, mainly in cryptocurrencies. Um, a million a month. <laughs> a million. So, um, yeah, I'd say probably pre-tax this year, I'll, I'll do 10. Mm. Um, so it's been a good year. And the thing that inspires me the most, we'll talk about, because you started, you said it when you were 16 years old. Yep. Things that inspired me the most was your whole stern, uh, your whole journey. Sorry, mm -hmm. so I think let's go all the way back. Mm -hmm. Let's go back to Russia mm -hmm. and let's talk about where it all began for you. Yeah, for sure. So, um, so yeah, go on. Yeah, basically, um, I mean, Khabib's done a lot for me to explain where I'm from. Before, yeah, okay, bef yeah. before Khabib, um, you know, no one really knew where Dagestan is. I'm from a place called Dagestan, Russia. Yeah. Um, on so, both sides, my mom's side as well as my biological father, um. So easiest way to explain it for anyone who doesn't know what, you know, Dagestan is like, it's like the movie Borat, except not in Kazakhstan, in Russia. Like literally, um, you know, my grandma's home, which is where I grew up for the first four years of my life. There's no toilet. You like, you come outside the house and my grandfather built the house with his own two hands. You come outside, you take a right, you take another right. You probably go down 15 meters, 20 meters, uh, past the chickens, past the cows, past all the, uh, the you know, uh, all the crops and all the vegetables. Um, and then you go and this is a little hut. You open it and you squat down, you do your business. And what if, what if someone's in there? Um, no, no, you'll know, you know, th there's a lock. There's okay, a lock. Okay. Um, we're not that bar barbaric. <laughs> um, so, you know, it really, I had a very, I was saying to you earlier, like I had a very, 
interesting. Like th there was such a juxtaposition in my childhood because, you know, I grew up in Russia for the first four years of my life. And then single mom, as I mentioned to you, my uh, father was an alcoholic abusive. Um, so, you know, he wasn't really in the picture, you know, uh, thank God my mom had the bravery to, to leave when she did. This is your biological father, yeah? Yeah, my biological father. Um, okay. So while this is all happening, my mom's, you know, my mom's a very young mom, um, you know, working three jobs. So kind of my, uh, my grandmother and my grandfather uh, raised me. Um, anyways, my mom is in Moscow on a, a little work trip and uh, she ends up meeting my stepdad or who was then to become my stepdad. They date for a year and a half and um, they even trial, you know, she comes to London for six months, then, you know, they trial living together, you know, things are getting serious. They end up marrying and, uh, you know, it's meant to be this whole like picture perfect story where this Russian village boy moves to London and my stepfather was very wealthy. So, you know, I go from having nine black and white channels to 999 color channels. I go from having, you know, no toilet to, you know, having a toilet to having a toilet, having you know, two or three in the house having, yeah, yeah, three, you know, um, you know, and moving to Chelsea, you know, and uh, I actually went to private school. So it was, I mean, shit, if by the age of five or six, the story ended there, it would have been a picture perfect tale. But, um, you know, very quickly that marriage kind of deteriorated. Um, so long story short, my stepdad stayed with my mom uh, for some tax benefits. Uh, he claimed uh, non-tax residency um, in the UK. And um, because we were here, he was able to still have a, quite a few properties and whole complicated stuff. Anyways, long story short. So there was a benefit for him to stay that, within the marriage. Yeah, that was a benefit for him. Uh, benefit for me and my mom was we lived in what was, or, you know, towards the end, definitely was a, a very broken home. I'm kind of mentioned to you earlier, you know, in the last three years that I was in my childhood home, there was no uh, warm water, like there was no heating, no warm water. And um, I said my uh, stepdad was a very complicated character. Mm -hmm. uh, when he found out I was building a business, he actually cut the Wi-Fi. <laughs> so uh, funny enough, that's actually why I'm still with three, the service provider. Back in 2015, they had a thing where um, for 25 pounds a month, they'd let you do like unlimited hotspot. Yeah. Um, so yeah, funny enough, six years on, that's that's still why I'm with them. Uh, I used to just hotspot off my phone, and uh, yeah, as I said, unfortunately, there's uh, there's no Wi-Fi. He was a uh, said quite a complicated character. So how long were you in London for until you know things? It became a bit of broken home mm. within your family. So um, it was probably things were uh, they definitely weren't perfect, um, but it wasn't unbearable. You know, probably until the age of like probably until like nine or 10. And then uh, when I was 11 years old, he cut us off fully. Um, and as I said, you know, I saw some things that you probably shouldn't see when you're that young. And, you know, just, I, there's some, some, I mean, there's a lot of stuff I really block out, but there's, you know, some vivid memories. I remember when I was, um, I remember when I was eight years old, there's a ring on the uh, home phone. I pick it up. I'm like, hello. I'm like, hi, this is um, London Escorts. Something along those lines. And I was like, oh, hi, like in my little kid voice, and like, uh, hi, we're looking for, uh, you know, um, we're looking to reach Mr. So-and-so. Yeah. And uh, I remember I put the phone down. My mom goes, who is that? Uh, who was that? I was like, oh, it was London Escorts. And my uh, stepdad was coming back from a business trip. And um, and uh, yeah, you know, he only ever spent like three months a year in London. So he really wasn't around that much. And I remember I told him, I was like, oh, it was London Escorts. And uh, she, uh I, there's no surprise, but there was a little bit of sadness in her face. And I was like, no, no, you don't understand. Like, and I, I had a rough understanding even at that age of what that meant. Yeah. I, I was like, no, you don't understand. Like they escort, like they escort him from like the airport to like the house. Like that it's like a driving company. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so as I said, you know, I had to, I grew up very quick in a lot of ways. Um, but things were bearable until I was like, 10 or 11 and then it said when he cut us off fully um you know the next five six years were quite tough so when he cut you off were you still living in chelsea or did you have to move up no still living still, still living, living in chelsea okay then yeah. um i said that was kind of our two benefits is we got to live in chelsea yeah uh, although a very broken home uh, in the most literal sense i mean th things were like caving in it had been refurbished for 20 years um and i said i got to go to private school yeah which was you know although i 
I said, I still block out a lot of stuff from that period of my life. It's, um, I mean, it was, I look back and it all makes sense and it's all like, wow, I could not have been any better suited for where I am today, you know, going to private school and, um, seeing how the wealthy people operate, um, and how they carry themselves. But then coming home and having that fire of like, you know, it's so funny as well. Like I, people always try to discredit people who come from good families. Mm. Like they're like, oh yeah, but he comes from a good family. I actually think that's more impressive. Like, as in, if you actually go out and make something for yourself, you know, you don't just get a job from your yeah, yeah. father's connection. They, they always say people are hungry. Like they always say people who come from the bottom are mm. the most hungry. Exactly. Which is obviously impressive. Mm. But then people who are hungry, who come from good families and good homes and, you know, they're, let's just say they're financially stable. Mm. If they're hungry and they're mm. going out there to do something for themselves. I think that is so incredibly impressive. And by the way, like, let alone like stable. I mean, like if you come from a very wealthy family where you don't really need to work to get the benefits of what, you know, building a business or you're building up your career, this or that, um, you know, uh, provides for you. I, I said, I think that's very impressive. So, you know, looking back, it all was kind of perfect. Uh, cause as I said, I went to private school. So I said, I got to see, I got to see how these people operate. And I knew it was all like, I always knew it was possible. You know, like people ask me all the time. They're like, you know, would, did you ever imagine you'd be here? And I'm like a hundred, like, I'd be like, look, I'd be lying to you if I said I didn't, like I knew for a fact and not like, you know, I would have a moderately, like I knew for a fact I would be worth tens, hundreds, billions. Like I'm a little, I'm 10 years quicker than what I anticipated my timeline would be. Yeah. But I always knew. Um, just, and, just a quick one there. When you were in private school, were there other kids wealthy or... What no, super like, well. Yeah, yeah no, I, I think I went to the most expensive private school, non-boarding, because I said, because <laughs> uh, my stepdad, uh, obviously when uh, him and my mom were on good terms, you know, he was, I mean, he was very, yeah, I mean, I've dealt with, you know, I've been in some very intense rooms with some very successful people to this day. He's still probably the only person on earth that scares the shit out of me. Like this man is insanely charming insanely intelligent like the most intelligent person i've ever met yeah um so yeah you know they had a very just extremely charming man um so they had a great marriage and i said you know uh, i ended up going to school from the age of like four years old um and then just ended up staying there uh all the way up until the age of 17 when i dropped out um so yeah no i mean i went to school with literally like billionaires kids um you know super wealthy elite Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So it was a, it was a very weird experience, um, in many ways. How do you think the you know hanging around the billionaires because they mm. obviously become your friends, mm. hanging around billionaire people, mm. much wealth, wealthy people, mm. and then you have a wealthy stepdad as well. Mm. How did that? Do you think that shaped your future? A hundred percent. So how? Yeah, hundred percent. Because to me, it wasn't money. Wasn't ever really like this big thing, or mm. it wasn't this unattainable thing. And one of the actually one of the most interesting things for me was going to my friends one of the most interesting things for me was going to my friend's parents house and seeing that they although they had all this external stuff they had the same level of happiness as going back home to my mom who used to hide the bank statements from me because she knew how like in, i couldn't sleep all night i would just think like i'd be 13 years old i'm like i need to do something um and that was that was also a very interesting lesson for me because i think you know when you come into money at a young age, like you really, a lot of people go off the rails and, you know, I've had my phases where I go very crazy and this and that, but I've always, I've been very sensible, um, mm. with, with all the, with the moderate level of success that I've achieved and, um, you know, the things that I do have available to me. Um, and as I said, I think for me, that's because I always knew, and you all, I always say like anyone who's like, Oh, you know, anyone who goes, uh, oh, money won't make you happy. I'm like, yeah, that is the truest truth in life. But if you have an experience, you can't really say it, you know. Um, so I always say you have to go through a paradigm to understand it. And um, it's something I still had to go through. But luckily, like I knew. I saw it like I saw it in my friend's parents, like they mm. weren't fucking happy. They were miserable. It was so obvious. So they're miserable. And then I'm going home to my mom and she's miserable. And I'm like, this money changes nothing. So let, me, I, let me ask you there now, mm, 21 years old, mm, you've got quite a bit of money. Mm, what's your take on it? Does, does it make you happy? Or? Not at all. No? No, no, no. I'd say the, by far the biggest, 
Because you're not experiencing it yourself. Yeah. No, the no, the hundred percent the biggest. You know, I, I look back and I'm like my honestly my happiest times. Um, or I wouldn't say my happiest times, but I'd say my most present times, like where I just felt like the most. And by the way, this is also I will say this is a reflection on me. Like this is something I still. And I've done a lot of work on it, but I still need to get way better at this. Like I need to be way more grateful for what I have around me and I need to be more cognizant of it and like present to the moment. And I do a lot of work around that, but it's still, I still need to remind myself. But like, you know, it's funny. I was actually saying to uh, my assistant the other day, uh, she, you know, I never, ever hire friends, but she's the, the one exception, you know, she's been a close friend of mine for six years. And, um, you know, I was actually talking to her about like, just some of the memories like you know we had growing up and i was like man those were like the fucking happiest times you know um and the issue with money is it's just like a, it's a never-ending game you know and you've got someone who just bought a 20 million 20 million dollar yacht and they're looking at the guy who has a 50 million dollar yacht um and they want that one yeah and it's it's always and then you know look you can always play the who has a bigger dick competition and someone will always have one Right. And, you know, as well, then I, su I suppose it's good in a way, because then it pushes you harder to mm. make sure you can go and get that. I think as long as you, as long you can, you're right. You can play the game just as long as you're aware that it can really Be suck you in. And it, yeah, you know, and as long as you know that, and as long as you know that, look, if I'm at X amount and I start making X, it's not going to fucking change anything. Like I can tell you, honestly, it's not going to change anything. Um, now on the flip side, if you have no money and you have, you don't have any financial means, um, then obviously that causes its own world of stress. But man, like I'd say like, honestly, when you're just making like, when you're just making like 50, 60 K a year, a hundred K a year, like I'd say those are like the happy, cause you're just so appreciative of like everything. Um, and as I said, I, I will say, um, that is also probably a reflection on some more work that I need to do mm. uh, in terms of being more grateful and really like embodying that as much as I already try to. Um, but yeah, as I said, it's it's tough. Like when, w w like, let me put it this way. you, I There's nothing material that could give me pleasure anymore. Like, because when you, and fair enough, you know, I can't buy the yachts I want to buy and I couldn't buy, but well, actually then again, yeah, probably I could buy any car that I want. Um, so when you know that it kind of takes the joy away from stuff yeah. so it's like you know like like i man i remember like even just i remember even just being like 16 and like you know buying a 60 pound kindle and like you know checking on amazon like seeing how far away it is and it comes and like i open it so slowly and i like it's like my prized possession in this and that and like you know when you when the whole world opens up to you financially like it you, that's a part of your life that you never really get enjoyment from ever again. Yeah. Um, apart from, you know, things that are sentimental or things that really bring a lot of value to your life. Um, so yeah, you know, I, I really genuinely, and, uh, you know, I'm not just saying this because as I said, I'll, you know, as we go through this podcast, I'll probably say stuff that people think are, is insane. Um, because as, you know, as I said, I'm a very blunt person. Um, yeah, I'm really not just saying like uh, this. It, it really is um, something where it just that magic wears off. 100%. <clears throat> now, I think this is the point in the podcast where as we're talking about money, we've got to kind of get a deeper background understanding of how you earn your money. Mm. Earlier on, you mentioned that when you started your first business, your stepdad turned the Wi-Fi off. Mm. <laughs> so what was the business that you had going for you at the time? And you were what, 16 then? 16 at the time. So basically, you know, the way that I fell into the agency world was, I didn't fucking realize I had an agency. Like my whole sort of entrepreneurial journey started when I was 14 years old. And um, I was a bit of, I could have, I'm sure been a very like cool kid in school, but I was a bit of an outcast. You know, I would, re, you know, uh, basically from the age of 14 to 17, I read a book a week. Yeah. Um, and that was probably the most pivotal aspect of my journey especially because at that time, you know, me being 21 and looking at everything around me, I do still have some ego and I still have like a, oh, but I'll listen to this, but I'm not gonna listen. Like, you know, there's something called Zen beginner's mind. You know, when I was 14, like it was like, oh, the book says do, the book says meditate. So I'm going to meditate. The book says go to the gym. So I'm going to go to the gym. Um, you know, and I just like absorbed everything like a sponge. So 
you know, when I was 14, I was reading all of these books and I felt so isolated in school, right? Because I'm a 14 year old kid and no one really, I mean, I will say I, I you know, all, mo, mo, be right back. <laughs> <laughs> I think that is, you, you, you want to open the top one? Uh, well, one's for the Josh. The top one is uh, the new G1s. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, is that your products? Yes. Yeah, let me see. I think this is a new uh, oh, s summer capsule. Oh, so is it? Okay. We're, we're doing a limited run. Yeah. Yeah, you can actually, I'm sure you can leave this in the podcast. So, yeah, we'll get a live reaction of, have you haven't seen this before yourself? Uh, not, in, not in person, it's the first time we've gone in the, so yeah. So these are the um, uh, blue light blockers that I was telling you about. So these are limited run, summer capsule. So there we go. We're going for a colorful look. I just said limited run. You want me to try them on? Yeah, go for it. <laughs> I can't zoom myself. I didn't look. You lot told me. You look yeah. suave. You look suave. I think I need to try the. We'll, we'll get you. We'll get you a more muted color. Yeah, I need. We'll, I need we'll get a, you some matte blacks. I mean, it. yeah, no, these are these are tough to pull off. These are good quality though. Oh, insane. Yeah, dude, insane. Honestly, how much you sell these for? Uh, Eighty-five. That's not bad at all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's slick, huh? Yeah, I mean, yeah. These are uh, well. These are. Intense. Anyways, let's get back to the podcast. <laughs> yeah, Cheers. All right, well, I don't know how this is going to be edited, but basically, we were talking Amazon parcel come, and uh, here we are. There we go. <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, what I was going to ask you is um, regarding the books. Mm -hmm. What made you want to pick up your first book at fourteen years old? Because it's unlike a fourteen-year-old to think, you know, what? I'm going to start reading. And mm -hmm. I'm guessing the t type of books you were reading were all, you know, self-help books. Yeah, I mean, I was, as I said, I was eight years old, and I, at the age of eight years old, I'm. I mean, first of all, I've also been a big reader. I was in fair enough. That's also because um, I said my uh, stepdad was a very complicated character. So by the age of eight, I was like, I had to read the entire Dickens works, like uh, fucking Mayor of Casterbridge. I've read that like 12 times micro. When you say he was complicated, are you basically saying he used to make you read these books? He was a full blown psychopath, like insane, dude. Um, yeah, no, I used to have to read those. I used to have to like. You know, I remember um, I was even like five years old and I uh, I dropped the fork, got locked out the house for a few hours. Mm -hmm. Like I remember uh, that or I said I would because, you know, uh, he grew up, um, he, you know, he went to boarding school, very strict uh, from the age of three years old. So, uh, um, you know, discipline was a big thing for him. Um, so, yeah, I said I, if I dropped the fork, I'd get locked in the garage for a few hours and I'd be fucking banging the door, like, you know, begging to let me out. Um, so as I said, it was a quite intense, <laughs> quite intense upbringing. Yeah, that, that is a bit crazy. Um, yeah, it felt very uh, Harry Potter-esque. <laughs> but um, anyways, um, where were we at? What made you want to start yes. getting self help? Yeah, self -help so, books uh, you know, from the age of like eight years old, I knew I was like, I, because that's when like, uh, I already knew the, the signs were starting to show. And by like, as at eight, even like 10, I was like, I, it's because it's just me and my mom. So I was like, I'm going to have to take care of my mom. And if I don't, we are fucked. And I knew that. I knew that for a fact. So, you know, while everyone else was enjoying themselves playing when, I, you know, they were 14 years old, I was like, okay, I got to start taking shit seriously. So I started reading books and reading another. And, you know, um, you know, I remember I would wake up before school at like 5 a.m. and I'd go for runs. Like I'd go for a run and then I'd read and then I'd journal and then I'd meditate. Um, and I kind of built my own schedule and, you know, from the age of like 13, 14, I knew I didn't care about school. Granted, I wasn't a very smart kid, um, but yeah, you know, so that's why I picked up books and it was just, those books were the thing that actually led me to that first business because I was reading all these books and I like didn't at that age have, you know, really anyone to express all these thoughts that were swirling around in my head. Mm. Um, I ended up creating this Instagram account called Fakuk the Norm, F-C-U-K the Norm. And I'll get, uh, you know, we'll pop it up on screen. That, so you can look back at the begin, the first post all the way, you know, maybe 20 posts from the last one that was posted. That's all me at the age of 14. Like all of those passages were me 
it was like a, a cathartic experience for me to like read books and have these ideas and just get it down on paper um or you know on instagram and so obviously what were you posting exactly i was just posting like quotes and then i was just long passages okay you know of things that were on my mind about like friendship about discipline about um manifestation about like you know um and I was building up this account and I was growing it. And then eventually one day I got someone reach, you know, DM me and they're like, uh, how much to buy your account? That That's a thing. Like I didn't know that was a fucking thing at the time. Um, and then that's how I got pulled into the world of Telegram. And I got into all of these uh, buying, selling groups for mm. Instagram accounts. And that's actually, so I, what I started doing was I, I sold a few shout outs and built up a little bit of capital. And then I bought my second Instagram account. So what I did, and this was my first business and it only ran for six or seven months. And then it kind of became like crabs in a bucket. Like everyone just kept undercutting each other in terms of prices. Yeah. Um, but what I would do is I would, you know, buy an account, let's say, I don't know, like an architecture account, like it really like high end modern interior account um, or like a account specifically focused towards Lamborghinis. And I would buy that account and then I would rebrand it to just a general luxury account because then I could sell shout outs to, you know, blue eye blocking glasses companies to watch uh, companies and anything luxurious. Yeah. And, and I'm sure you remember 2014, like that was kind of the inception of influencer marketing. Mm -hmm. like that's really, I mean, you look at a company like movement, like that's, that is how they got to, you know, I think they sold for what a hundred million or at least the owners. Um, I don't know how much percentage they sold, but you know, that's how you reach a valuation like that when, Let's be honest, they're they're a dropshipping company. Like <laughs> that's you know, it's not really uh yeah, or at least for the longest time, uh for a very long time, they're really just a glorified dropshipping company. Um but it's because they had the marketing of the influencers. Yeah, they had the them. marketing, the influencers, et cetera, et cetera. They so really buy it. that was my first business. And as I said, it got to a point where things were just like um things were just, you know, people just kept undercutting each other. So I had that, and then I also had my mom like fucking shouting at me all the time because, you know, she came from Russia, sacrificed everything, stayed in, got out of one abusive relationship, got into, stayed in another one um, because just so I could have, go to private school. And in her mind, it was like, okay, this, my son is pissing everything, every, I've sacrificed my entire life. Yeah. And he's pissing it all away. So I remember when I was 14, I was like, okay, you know, I'm going to try to take studies seriously, this, that. Um, and just, then- Just a quick one about the accounts. How much were you buying them and flipping them for? Uh, in the low end, you know, in the first first few ones I, I did was, you know, $100, $200, mm. um, $100, $200 pounds, whatever. Uh, and then by the end, it was a couple grand. Probably I made, uh, through my entire uh, time of that, probably made 10 grand uh, in six too. months. Yeah, it was great. I mean, that sustained me as well for the next, you know, year and a half, two years. So after that, I got really into training. So what I would do is I would... Uh, you know, I mentioned this earlier, I would reach out to people on Instagram that had like level three personal trainer in their bio. And I would ask them like for, I think it's like the NCS or something like that, basically like the, the, the book that they would get that they would have to study um, in order to get their level three qualification. And I would just study and I'd take notes and this and that. And then I'd be at my friend's parents' house and I would, I mean, I was so annoying. I don't know how I didn't get kicked out of more, house, like more dinners, but um, I would just like selling my friend's parents on personal training services. Yeah. Uh, so I'd sell them, you know, for 20 pounds an hour, 25 pounds an hour. And as I said, you know, I went to private school, you know, these are wealthy Rich, parents, yeah. you know, so for them, it's fucking nothing. Um, and that was kind of my second business. And then from there, I got really into like photography and videography. And that's kind of how the inception of my agency. So I started doing that. And then I had um, people asking me like, hey, can you do this as like a monthly service? Like, yeah, of course. And um, you know, before, this, before we talk about the monthly service, how did you get your first client for the agency? Free. Uh, well, uh, so f I was really just a freelance content creator. Yeah. So just free shoots, four or five, six months, just free, you know, every single weekend. Um, and as I said, then I started getting paid for it. And there was actually my old football club. Uh, I was telling, you know, the owner, I was like, yo, look, like, you know, you can do a lot more with your social media. And um, he was like, how much? And I was like, I'll never forget the proposal I sent. I didn't price monthly because I thought it would sound too expensive. So I priced it weekly and I didn't want to do a hundred pounds a week. So I did 95. Yeah. So my first client was 380 pounds a month. Yeah. And for that, I was doing 30 unique Instagram posts, 30 unique Facebook posts, four YouTube videos. Mm. 
like when you take it, you know, when you basically split it up, I was basically working minimum wage. But I mean, it was like the fucking greatest thing ever to me. Like the idea that I had like monthly income coming in. From and, something that you're doing yourself rather than a set out job. Yeah, exactly. Um, so I did that. And then for the next six, seven months, I was just was meeting uh, with business owners, reaching out, um, sending emails, um, sending emails, doing Instagram outreach, sending uh, video audits, um, not really getting anywhere, um, but I didn't care. Mm. You know, I think that's the other, it's a great blessing, you know, because you've got like, you know, you've got people like yourself who bring on characters that are talking about their journey five years in or seven years in, because yes, I've been running my business for five years, but the three years before that, you know, 2014, 2015, 2016, like- It's all part of the journey. Yeah, reading a book a week, I'm meditating every single day. Like it's, you know, I didn't have the technical know-how, but I had, like, I, I had that ferocious, like, self-belief, Yeah. you know? Um, so obviously it's a blessing that you're bringing people like myself on, but it's also like, you know, people watching this will compare themselves and like, oh, why am I not? And it's like, I didn't have that. You know, I was 16, I was sending these proposals and I was going fucking nowhere, but I didn't care. Like, I wasn't like, oh, but there's this person doing this. And you know, like I didn't, I wasn't comparing myself to anyone. I was just happy. I was like, this mm. is so cool. Like I, my, my friends are in school learning about shit that doesn't matter and will never matter. And I'm here like just, and it doesn't matter if I'm not signing clients. Like I'm just, I'm doing something. And I'm like, it was just, it was the coolest thing ever. And, you know, I kept going and I kept going. And then eventually, you know, I will say when it rains, it pours. Um, and you know, same thing, even at my agency these days, you know, you know, things will kind of plateau like this and then, you know, I'll, so like, yeah, it's the yeah. ex exact same thing. I, feel, I know exactly what you're thinking, but the same thing with the channel, you know, it plateaus, the next, you know, it spikes and it can go down and it's just like anything really. Yeah. You know, <clears throat> I just want to ask you something, um, like perspectively, 380 pounds, it sounds like nothing. However, some people might think like, you know, it turns out by 10, you've got 10 clients a month. That's 3,800 pounds. Mm. You're getting a month. Mm. Now, if you compare that to what you charge now, I know you said you take percentages, mm. but if you had to charge a flat fee to companies and brands, mm. how much you charge? Like, what's the difference? Yeah, we do. I mean, you know, some brands we charge over five figures a month. Mm. Um, so yeah, it totally depends. You know, we've changed our model over, over the years just because yeah. it's, uh, we think it's a more honest model, yeah. you know, so what we use now. Quite but, a drastic change. Yeah, drastic I mean, by, change, by, by 2018, you know, I was telling you the, you know, Danny, who's still my CMO to this day, you know, he's been working me, uh, for me for three and a half years. Um, you know, but initially he was just a contractor. And, you know, the moment I realized was when I signed a, uh, you know, uh, well over a five figure a month retainer, I was, you know, 18 years old. And I was like, yeah, I should probably actually like have someone full time for this. Yeah. Um, so yeah, you know, it's obviously it's come a long way since then. Yeah. You're smashing it. I mean, absolutely mm -hmm. smashing it. So yeah. So where do we go from here? So, so let's see. So, so six, seven months, I'm saying these proposals, nothing's happening. Yeah. When it rains, it pours, I end up. Um, I end up doing the shoot for a company called Athlete, who are now, uh, you know, rebranded Gemflow. And, you know, uh, Sean, who's the uh, founder and the, the owner of it, is like, was definitely one of my early mentors. And like, I'll be honest, I hate the word mentor. And like, everyone has the idea of mentor of like, you sit down with each other every single week and you like, like, no, like I, for me, it was just like osmosis. Like, I just fucking would hang around Sean because yeah. obviously he was my client. And I was in their office all the time and this and that. And it was just like his work ethic is just, it still is it's sickening. Like it's in, I've, yeah. You like, I, you just, what it is, you get inspired by the mm -hmm. people that you're around and you start to pick up habits that they have. And then it's kind of, I guess someone from the outside would call it a mentor, but really yeah. to you, it's just someone you're they, around. They, they are. But as I said, to me, a mentor is like, it's always, I find it always comes organically. Mm. You know, it's not like, a, okay, I'll be your mentor. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. Um, Naturally, you find it. You yeah. find out who you click with and who you actually, not inspired to be, but who you can actually learn a lot more mm. from. Mm. And yeah, it's never one of them ones where you, can you be my mentor? <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. So I ended up signing, um, so I did a shoot for them. And then once again, that conversation started of like, okay, could this be a monthly thing? Could you manage our social media and this and that? So I ended up signing them and that was on the Monday and that was 1900 pounds a month. And I remember, cause I actually, all the uh, rooms in the school were taken. So I literally went on like outside the steps of my school, hotspot on my phone. And um, I had my computer open as I was sending the invoice and uh, Sean was like, okay, you know, we're good to move uh, forward 1900. I remember I, I ran into the, the uh, I, I ran into the uh, cafeteria and my best friend still to this day, Filippo, dude, I, I, I scream at him, I'm like, dude, I didn't say I'm rich. I went, 
dude, we're rich. Yeah. I'm like, dude, we're fucking rich. Um, and that was the Monday. The next day I signed a, uh, another client, personal trainer, 1500 a month. And then I signed another client that week on the Friday for 750. So within the space of a week, I went, you know, I was doing up to what, 4,000, 4,200 pounds a month, something like that. And then after that, very quickly, as I said, when it rains and pours, like there, there's, there will be periods of stagnation and it can be frustrating as that for me back then, it wasn't frustrating because I had no contact. Like for me, I was like, what else would I be doing? Like, this is so sick. I didn't need the result. Just like the fact that I had the honor of do like just doing something that was out the order. Like that was exciting enough for me. Yeah. But um, yeah, you know, uh, within the space of a month or six weeks thereafter, you know, I was up to 10 grand a month and at 17 years old, like I felt like fucking richest person on earth and I uh, ended up dropping out of school. Um, how did how did your mom take that? You know, obviously, because she's had rough, to make a big change. Rough. Things are rough for a long time. Yeah, because if her, and I mean, she, you know, obviously now she. Tell, looked, tell me the conversation or tell the viewers as well that like, the conversation, if you can remember it word by word of you telling your mom that, listen, I've dropped out of school, mm. basically. Yeah. So, I mean, I was in a fortunate position where even at that point at the age of 17, I was still supporting her in a lot of ways. Mm. And obviously I was supporting myself. So it's kind of like, what could she really say? Um, but for her, and I mean, you know, she even says this to this day, like it's the biggest thing was identity. Like that was her identity. Mm. You know, for a mother, like a mother's identity is, you know, or at least, you know, uh, in my mom's case, I was her identity. And then also her identity of being a good mother was the fact that she went through unspeakable things to make sure that I went to private school. Yeah. So when that gets taken away, it's like, what's left? And that's a big like f- head fuck. Um, so yeah, it was, there was a lot, a lot of months of fighting. Um, but as I said, I dropped out, scaled my agency, and you know, I got up to a point where a few months after that, I was doing 20, 25 grand a month, uh, even had a full-time employee at that time. Um, and things were going great. And my only issue was the fact that my clients kept saying, oh, this is amazing. You know, you're creating this beautiful content, our social platforms are growing, et cetera, et cetera. Et cetera. But what's the ROI? And I had no discernible ROI I could give them, you know? And it is especially frustrating for me because, you know, these big, co- you know, I was working with a lot of uh, companies that had their series A, series B, like startups. Yeah. Um, and I was like, you guys are spending five grand a month on red bus ads. Like what fucking ROI is that giving you? Right. But because they're, they had a swanky office, they didn't question it and this and that, um, you know, I guess I had a lot more to prove to them. So from that frustration, and the thing is, in my business is I'm not a very, it's funny because, you know, obviously my business I've been running for five years is a service-based business, but I'm not a good person to be in the service. Like I'm not, uh, I've actually, a lot's changed, you know, these days I do take pride on that. But back then I was not a very good accommodating person. Like I was the opposite of who you would think would have a service-based business. Yeah. Like I fucking hated like clients that would complain and this and that, et cetera, et cetera, or like any sort of these um, misunderstandings and, so from that frustration, uh, I decided, you know, I need to learn paid traffic and I need to learn ads, you know, so that way I can present to them, hey, at the end of the month, I brought you in X amount of leads because I was working with local businesses, or at least that was the intention back then. So I start that and I tell all my clients, I'm like, hey, you know, you're paying 2,500 pounds a month, you're paying 1,500 pounds a month, you know, two grand a month for an extra 500 a month, 750 a month, let me tack on uh, Facebook ads. Yeah which I thought was a smart idea. You know, I was giving it to them for a subsidized fee, which I thought was a smart idea. Only issue was I sucked terribly. And, you know, because I sucked, they were pissed. And not only, because they were super happy with the creative stuff. So not only did I lose them for the ad stuff, but then I also lost them for the creative stuff. So I went from making 25 grand a month to going all the way down to five, and really having to go back to the drawing board and you know i just decided you know what, i'm still just going to focus on ads paid traffic and um ended up working with gyms that was my niche i worked with for how long did that period last for from you know being dropped from 25 grand down to five grand which is still a lot of money per yeah. month yeah how did how did that like last for and it wasn't too bad it was a few months you know it was a few months but it was i just i don't know it's, it's always tough you know when you take like a step backwards. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, you know, um, you feel like you've just gone in a complete opposite direction. You have all yeah. the momentum going forward, and the next, you know, bang, it's all yeah. gone down. Exactly. So, yeah, I uh, I stuck to it, 
and eventually built back up, you know, 10, 15, 20K. But the real big change in my business was when I decided, you know, what's, what am I most passionate about? I'm really passionate about the education system. Um, so I decided, you know what, I, and I've always loved online education. I think online education is far superior um, to universities in every single way. Um, and, you know, online education, you know, I have my own education platform. You know, we actually have to do things like, you know, give a shit about our customer, put money towards R&D, give refunds, you know, something that a university will never fucking do. Um, you know, so... What sort of education platform do you have? So my education company, Gradency, the way that that started was I was 17 years old, making 25 grand a month. And, yeah. you know, everyone was... And, you know... The other cool thing that people can do is you can look back on my YouTube. I've been posting YouTube videos since 2015. Yeah, so yeah, you can yeah. see me vlogs of me in 2015 and I would go to, um, you know, bricks and bookmongers because, yeah. I, you know, I, I couldn't afford to spend 10 or 15 pounds for a new book at Waterstone. So I'd go to bricks and bookmongers and for 10 pounds, I'd walk away with five used books, but they were basically like brand new. Um, so you can see my journey of me like meditating, going to the gym, reading. And I was just sh like just sharing my journey on, on my YouTube. One thing I will uh, recommend you guys watch, but after this podcast is the you got a video of your journey. Yeah. And I think in there, I was watching it last night and I think in there it, you had the phone call recorded of you getting the client for £1,900 a month. Am I yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or something like that. Or you calling your friend. Yeah, I think so. So it's amazing to see. Yeah, no, it's, it's cool. Change. I mean, you can see me in all my like, you can see me in all my clients like offices and because yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I said I would just like vlog and this and that um so anyways I um with all that being said people were because I was sharing stuff on social media and this and that people were like so what's the deal are you like selling drugs or like well, you know how the fuck are you making this sort of money um and I used to, at the end of the day, I used to just give people like you know, back then my Skype and I'm like, oh, you know, like I'm happy to hop on a call and just run through some stuff. And then it was starting to become a real distraction from the main business. Um, so then I would just start saying no to people. And then mm. people were like, oh, I'll, I'll pay you. And that was like such a foreign concept to me. You know, now like the idea of a consulting fee is like, you know, I've done it dozens and dozens of them at the agency, you know, 25K, two day consultings. Um, you know, now I don't do them much anymore because don't really like to travel. Um, but back then that was like such a foreign concept to me. Um, so I was like, they're like, hey, yeah, how, how much do you, will you charge for an hour? I was like, I don't know, like 50 pounds, like a hundred pounds. And it just snowballed and then it got too much doing these like calls. Um, so then that's when right at the beginning of 2018 or actually like February of 2018, I launched my first course. And is this where Grow Your Agency started, basically? Not really. So, because here's the thing, in 2018, I was a course business. And the thing is, because the course scaled so quickly, in 2018, I was probably making three times as much profit mm. from my course company as I was from my agency. And that's all fine and well, but the education industry, the online education industry is so fickle. Like, I've, I've never seen anyone who has, like, a course or this or that, like, last more than two or three years. Very, very few people do. Because, you know, imagine, like, a YouTuber. Like, people get bored of YouTubers after, you know, yeah. usually after, like, two, three years. You have to do something to switch you up. You know, imagine if you're an education YouTuber. Like, people get fucking bored of you, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and people always want that new thing, the new method, which all these new methods are usually just old methods repackaged with a new, like, the the this and this method. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? Um, and I kind of knew that in 2018, you know, I, luckily one of the things that I'd say probably my biggest strengths is the fact that I've always had really strong um, foresight. Like I always know what's coming around the corner. And in 2018, I was like, this is great, but I know I probably have another six months of this before people are like, but I'm not bringing the level up at all. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's when I knew, okay, I need to take this from a course business, which is really all it was to a real education company you know, have a real brand name, bring on a team, you know, in 2018, it was just me and uh, my old appointment setter for my agency. Yeah. When I was working with gyms, he was the one who was cold calling all these clients, setting the meetings, I would show up, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, Esteban, he still actually works for the education company. Um, <laughs> so it was just him, you know, uh, helping me out uh, with some of the questions in the Facebook group and this and that. Uh, but I knew that wasn't going to last and it wasn't, it wasn't real business. Um, so that's when I decided to go you know, go and take what was really a course business and make it an education company, turn into gradient C. I hired a product, a product manager, 
hired a team. I brought on expenses. Um, fucked my profit margins fully. Uh, but you made it a legitimate, proper business. But I made it a real business, you know, yeah. and probably uh, a lot more scalable as well. Yeah, exactly. And also the other thing is, the thing with the agency is it's just over, over a five year span. It just constantly like goes like this. You know, of course there'll be little bumps and this, but it's just it's just so. My agency is, as I said, it's. I'm not gonna lie, it's very unsexy. It's very uncool, but it's just predictable. And as I said, there'll be some hiccups here and there, but it just every year, just year on year, it grows, right? Um, and because especially 2019, 20 or uh, towards the tail in 2018. Uh, that was the first month where I hit 80K with my agency. So because the agency was doing really well, now I was able to start thinking more long-term with the education company or really what at the time was a course business and go, mm. okay, how can I actually make this something that like has an impact on the industry and yeah. like isn't just for my benefit? Um, and as I said, that's when I created Greency and that's when we really kind of dialed in our mission. So one of the big things that we do is we take a large portion of our profits and use that to build schools in Nepal. Um, so yeah, at the, you know, at the time of speaking, there's 2,000 kids who get to wake up and go to school that, you know, wouldn't have normally been able to. Um, and that's been, yeah, I mean, that's just been the most incredible experience ever. Um, How does that make you feel, knowing that you're, you're, you're able to educate over 2,000 kids, um, whereas they wouldn't normally be able to get it? I mean, you know, you know, the interesting thing is I took my, unfortunately, I've been able to go there for a year and a half because of everything that's gone on in the world and travel restrictions and this and that. Mm. Um, but I took some of the team out there in 2019 towards the tail end. And one of the most interesting things was that, uh, I'll be honest, the kids, like, of course, they're like, okay, the kids don't really care that much if I'm being honest. It's, it's the elders. Like it's the, it's the parents, it's the grandparents, because they know that the biggest thing is in these communities, there's no opportunity. So when you build a school and when you give these kids a real education, then they, they don't leave their, they don't have to leave their communities anymore. Yeah. You know? And what that means for the parents is they get to actually have their child, you know? Whereas before, if there's no school, they get to 15, 16 and they start, you know, they, they start going into the cities, yeah. you know, uh, and they lose their children. Yeah. So that was one of probably the most, interesting and gratifying things is like yeah of course you know we build these schools and it's incredible but like it's really nice to know that the the parents and the grandparents like it actually means more to them way more than the children yeah and i'm sure. sure later you know when the kids grow up they'll understand you know what it mean uh, what it actually means but they'll probably repeat, repeat the same actions when their time comes for kids yeah exactly so um yeah it's just, all in all it's just been incredible experience and you know that's really what gradency was and 2019 and 2020 and most of 2021 but around beginning of 2020 i was like this is cool but it's this is, it still isn't like i i wouldn't be able to confidently look at it and be like oh we really shook up the industry we did something that was never done before and like we we did something that was important to like at the end of the day i know i'm in such a weird funny little nerdy industry right mm. i'm i'm not a rapper i'm not a football i'm not cool right i'm like a fucking grandpa but to me my work means so so much and like to me doing something for the culture as funny as that sounds in the in the in our industry it, it means something to me and that's why you know beginning of 2020 i had this itch of like okay how do we really take things to the next level so for the last year and a half i mean so much money and time has gone into I mean, insane amounts of money, which is why, as I said, you know, Great he hasn't really made much money in the last year and a half. All the money's been funneled into the schools and R&D costs for this custom platform. So now when you come in, it's no longer an education company. It's a real educate, like it's a platform. It's you come in, it's all custom, custom app, custom community, um, custom tools. We have 15 different tools where, you know, uh, someone comes in and they want to check if their ads are compliant. You put it in there and we'll tell you what's not compliant, suggestions for what to change in the copy. Uh, you come in there, you have your whole financial tracker. You've got um, different tools to help you know how much to spend on different ad sets, to spend on cold retargeting, to spend on, uh, you know, if you're working with a local biz client or an online client, we've got um, uh, calculators. So that way you can, uh, again, estimate for how much an e-commerce business is doing based on their foot traffic. And we show you how to find that. You know, uh, and then based on the industries we have, you know, because we've worked with so many different clients, um, you know, we know industry standard within e-commerce businesses, how much um, uh, their conversion rate is. And then we can give you an estimate. Like 
it's a real fucking platform, you mm -hmm. know, and it's it's like it's got a heartbeat and there's real time leaderboards and there's man, I mean, this thing's there's insane. It. It's something revolutionary. Yeah. And it's something I can actually look back in and like it, it's, with the course business, like I couldn't look. I wasn't necessarily. I mean, look, I've had I've had literally people who from 2018 came into my program making no money and these days make 100K a month profit. Many, many like many, many, many people. Um, and that's awesome. Of course, but like, as I said, you know, the course business didn't give me much satisfaction. The education came, uh, company gave me a lot of fulfillment, mm. but the, what we've done now with the platform, uh, it's like, I don't know. I really like it. It fills me with a lot of pride. So that's the, uh, education company side of things. <laughs> now, let me ask you, because you've got to grow, grow your agency and you obviously have your own agency mm. yourself. Why would someone want to, in your instance, why would someone want to help other people's agencies, get them clients when you could you know, you could easily get those clients mm. yourself. Because I've had many opportunities where, even though I don't have a social media agency, mm. people, brands, they do reach out to me sometimes because they see the stats and figures and they're like, we want to do the same thing. Can you mm. can you help us set up a YouTube channel or run our Instagram or whatever it may be? So I'm like, I could easily charge for this, but at mm. the same time, can I be bothered? I don't know. Mm. Why would someone want to, why would you help other people make, you know, do you know what I mean? Yeah, no, no. People, <laughs> it's a weird one. Yeah, because technically I'm creating competition for myself. Exactly, yeah. And I think if I, so as I said, we work with e-commerce businesses and education companies. And I think if I was working with real estate agents and in order to hit, you know, 150K months profit, I need 100 clients, right? Mm. And there's only, I mean, uh, then again, there's maybe a bad example. There's so many real estate agents, but like, let's see something that's, let's say I was working in the solar industry and I needed you know, 50 clients to hit the numbers that I want to hit. And, you know, if I'm helping other people and I'm educating other people, then it's, you know, that's taking away from my pie. Yeah. I, I tell my students, you can't do what I do. You can't, or at least the level that we do it. I mean, we work with clients, as I said, we, we work with clients that are, you know, we're making two, three million a month for, you know, um, rev at least. We work with clients that are spending, you know, some of our clients are spending 20, 30 K a day. And as I said, I'm very honest with myself. You're not going to be able to, maybe after three years, maybe after five, but yeah. you're not going to be able not to instantly. sign them. Uh, and I'm very honest with you. You're not going to be able to sign the sort of clients that we sign. So, because because you're a few years behind and you also will be, right? Yeah. Um, Are you able to say a couple of your clients names like the big ones? Yeah. So, well, I mean, you know, the funniest thing is, uh, you know, some more notable names, Aura Ring, mm. um, Aura Ring. And we've had like some other big names in terms of like uh, Kevin Rose, AJ Smart, um, Avare, like, but the funniest thing that I found as well, and I have a lot of friends like this is like, dude, we have clients that are making 30 million a year and they literally are like a glow in the dark, like a, a teddy bear that helps kids fall asleep, you yeah. know, or like, and I even tell my friends, cause a lot of my friends want to start e-commerce brands and I'm like, start an e-commerce brand, but just know that if you want to make big money, you, you probably won't do it by selling fashion or like jewelry or like the the people that make a lot of money they sell just really fucking weird products yeah but the market loves and these guys are making like 30 40 million a year but it's not like the sort of thing where you're at a party and you're like oh i you know like i, I sell teddy bears for a living yeah i, I sell massage <laughs> you know like we have a client that like sells massage guns and it's like i mean yeah, i don't know maybe you that's something to boast about but you know uh as i said our biggest clients are the ones that f have weird products and you actually would never even realize yeah. that they're making that sort of money and also the sort of clients i like to work with i really dislike clients that have investors where there's a lot of uh, bureaucracy you know um as i mentioned i'm super into my watches and through it was a referral through uh, one of my old clients kevin rose uh he introduced me to hadinki that is literally my wet dream like th that is I, you could not think of a more perfect clan, right? And that probably would have been over a five figure a month retainer. And I didn't take the conversation any further because, th you know, I was speaking to the marketing manager who then had to relay it to this person. And it, I just, you got to go through a lot of people to get through to the main person, a lot of back and forward, and then a lot of back and forward on their side. I don't want to fucking deal with that. Like, I, it's a, you know, for me, from day one, I wanted to do it my way. Yeah. And I don't want to fucking deal with, like, I don't ever, all my clients treat me and my team with such respect and as such equals. And I don't give a shit how much money we get paid. If that's not the case, I don't want it. And these, these big, um, you know, these big companies, like, 
there's just so much fucking bureaucracy and it's just i i'm just not interested you know if other people want to do it like go for it but for me like uh, i said i'm not interested so yeah. i said that you know when you when we mention big clan names funny enough we specifically try to go for really big businesses but that are run by two 27 year old dudes mm. and i they're young in the prime yeah i mean i i specifically go for clients that are between like 22 and 35 i don't like clients who are above the age of 35 why is that do you think there'll be an older generation where they don't really understand the newer trends and the things yeah it's just you need boring i mean and once again every once in a while i'll be like oh let me make an exception you know there was one client uh i know i can't say the name but like um anyways they do 25 million a year in in retail and they do only like 2 million a month or, or 25 million a year in wholesale and they do like 2 million a month uh, or sorry um 2 million a year uh in uh with their e-commerce store and it's these fucking three like 55 year old dudes and it's just you know it was just fucking i hate it like i hate it every single moment and the funny thing is like as i said i am so lucky to have danny my cmo who's been working with me for three and a half years and he manages the rest of the team and i don't even have to deal with it but even just being on some of the calls like i just it was a fucking nightmare um <laughs> so yeah you know i you especially at this stage i'm at a point where like unless i do it my way i'm, I'm not interested yep. i think there's a lot in a lot about you that people can learn from like myself and other people who are watching this and aspire to be in your position in the position that you are in today so what's some of like the things that you'd advise some of the habits that you've had to get into the position where you are today biggest thing is if you're at a point right now and you're like look i have no idea where like i have no idea if you're me at 15 years old you know living at home with your mom and you you know that you've got something inside of you but you don't know what that will be um for me the biggest thing is reading and meditating like the fact that they teach fucking algebra at school the most useless load of horseshit for 99 percent of people by the way like i'm not a like some of my closest friends are like in the top universities studying biology are going to be some of the top lawyers on earth i have full respect for them because they genuinely from the bottom of their heart that's what they love and i can see in their eyes yeah, right yeah. and i have other friends of mine who i call out you know because i'm like dude you don't do this because you want to make your parents happy like you're gonna you really want to make a deal with the devil like sell your soul um but i said these people like they love it from the bottom of their heart you know so i have no issue if someone genuinely loves algebra mm. you know but for 99 percent of people they don't right and for me i find it so hilarious that you know in school they teach you all this stuff but they don't teach you uh meditation they don't teach you um you know how to deal with anxiety they don't teach you like everything like 80 percent of success really is managing oneself um and that's why as i said i think meditation is so important i'm so grateful that sure. i started meditating from the age of 14 mm. because you know and i'm i'm very big into union psychology i genuinely believe the world of the outer is merely a reflection of the world of the inner quick on for meditation how do you meditate because i think a lot of people might just be thinking that because i do have a bit of a young audience mm. here as well they might just be thinking you know one of them ones yeah, just yeah, yeah. do that so how yeah, do you so, meditate so, What's so, so find what works for you as i said for me it was funny because when i was 14 years old in the same way i had a gym split i actually had a meditation split mm. so, you know maybe monday would be vipassana and then uh tuesday would be mantra and then wednesday would be kundalini meditation and i got really into it you know these days depending on the time of year so, so, you know sometimes i challenge myself and i do an hour a day but most of the year i just do 10 minutes yeah you know and it doesn't need to be anything special you know you can f meditation can be as simple as lighting a candle and just looking at the candle it can be as simple as just you know focusing on your breath um doing different breath work or the easiest place for people to get started is headspace you know it's free just do the first 10 days see how you feel 10 days in it's insane yeah um and also the other thing is med meditation really can be whatever you want i have clients of mine who i have clients of mine who literally make 10 20 million a year and they're like, yeah, I've tried meditation, doesn't work for me. So they do, like for them, go, they do a 45 minute walk every day, but no music, no, no phone. Yeah. And that's their meditation. You know, really for me, meditation is just like, what's your ability to focus in on something? You know, what's your ability? Like just, for me, it's just all about presence. Like, can you get present to the moment and focus on one thing? And that carries over into business or career or this, that, because like the people that win are the people who can focus on something for long extended periods of time. And every single year, things just get fucking worse and worse. As if like social media wasn't bad enough, then there's TikTok. And then now it's like, 
it's just insane. And there's a lot that's going on around the world, around stimulus our Stimulus everywhere. You yeah. know, people wake up, the first thing they reach for is their phone. And, you know, they've got a notif- like. I'm so glad I got out of that habit because I used to do that a lot. Now, mm. if I wake up at, I don't know, 8 o'clock, I won't check my phone until about 10. Yeah, good. Two hours, just get, get yourself- breakfast and gym out of the way and then come back on my phone. 100%. That's it. But I think I think the best way for meditation, just to clear your head, me, I found my, my best way recently, even though it's a bit long, jacuzzi. <laughs> yeah. Best thing. Dude, j- like jacuzzi, steam room sauna, if you have that available to yeah. you, like could be any, just like, just a time where you can just get present to the moment and just not, Everyone's just fucking trying to run away from their emotions. They're trying to run away from their thoughts. Mm. Um, so yeah, it, it, meditation really can be whatever you make it. Hundred percent, hundred percent. What else would you say? Meditation and reading. reading right? yeah. Meditation and reading, and then between those two, because when you get very self-aware, you'll find what the next step is. You know, like it doesn't need to. Looking back, as I said, everything that happened in my life, it made. Now looking back, it makes sense. But at the time, it made no sense to me. Yeah, you know, sure. there was times where I was like, even as I was successful, like I was like in despair because I was like, I don't know where this is going or I don't know what the next move is or what the next step is. And then you just need time to get in touch with yourself. And then when a p- opportunity presents itself or when your intuition, you know, most people aren't, don't trust their intuition enough or don't trust their gut instinct enough. And then when that time comes about, as if you actually have the ability to listen to that, then you'll know what the next step is. So let me ask you a question. Yeah, this this might be a bit personal. So if nothing's personal to me. All right, then we'll see how this is. Yeah. <laughs> how do you feel? How do I word it? It's a weird one because uh, you're essentially your mom meeting your stepdad has brought you to London, mm. able to get you in the positions that you're in today. Mm. How do you feel about, not necessarily your stepdad, but being in that environment where is he's basically a psycho, mm. but you, it's allowed you to get into the position you are today. I've, mm. And I'm, it sounds like without him almost, it might have been a bit harder. You probably would have mm. done it. No, I don't think so. No? No, I think looking back, I think it's one of those, I think looking back, it's kind of like, I think if one thing was off, I I genuinely don't know if I'd be here, right? Like, I think if I had that really tough childhood, but I didn't have the context of, like, wealth and going to this private school, like, I don't think I'd be, I think it would be, I think I would have been beat down by life so hard with no hope of getting out, or, like... Do you think you'd still be in Russia? Well, I mean, I, yeah, obviously, my, if my mom uh, didn't meet my stepdad, then yeah, I would 100% still be in Russia. Yeah. I was, uh, my, uh, you know, my mom was the youngest of seven in the Soviet Union, and her uh, sister is in the, uh, was it the FS, FSP or something like that? You know, like the mm. uh, Russian Special Services. So yeah, no, I was going to be an army kid. Um, so yeah, no, that was what my destiny was meant to be. Um, but yeah, as I said, looking back, I think if one thing was off, I would not be here today and you know i hold no hate in my heart at all towards anyone um i had led you here yeah because i said it and also like when you realize that like people aren't what they are usually they're a combination of their experiences so like you if you're judging a person like you can't judge a person because you you didn't have the same inputs as them yeah um so yeah i really hold no hate in my heart towards anyone or anything that happened in my past fair enough What's your ultimate goal? Because you're very successful in your own right mm. as, as you are right now. But I mm. can see from talking to you, from having the cigar with you, mm. you've got a lot of ambition and you've got goals that you want to hit mm. and you're still very young. So what is, what do you see your life looking like when you're 35 years old? Because you're 21, so that's a um, long way let's away. Let's see, thir- 35. I think, I mean, like I will. So I think the thing is you get to a point where you realize the real reward of this game is getting to continue to play the game. Yeah. You know, and that's why like you've got all these super successful billionaires and like, you don't like, they never need to work ever again. Why do they keep working? Because like, it's a love of the game, you know? Um, And I'm kind of now at that point where like, you know, even as I said this, especially before it was, yes, of course I could kind of, you know, I could retire and this, but really after this year, like I could retire and still, live off like my investments could make me more money than what i live off right now you know so that's a 
scary and also exciting thing because now I can genuinely look at like now I really have been able to look at everything I'm doing and be like if I didn't make a cent from it would I still do it? and the answer is yes mm. right and as I said for me it's because like I don't know it's just like building's fun you know like building is fun and that's really what business is it's just like building stuff and like putting building blocks together and this and that so you know in terms of my businesses I have now, you know, uh, I'm very confident in this software company. I'm very confident in the education company. Uh, with the agency from next year, moving to a model where we're going to start taking equity in clients we work with. And by 2025, the only clients we work with will work with 10 to 12 clients and they'll all be companies that I've invested in um, or they've given us equity just because of our expertise. And obviously we'll be managing all their marketing Yeah. Uh, because the thing is, I'm in a funny situation where with clients outward facing, we're a paid traffic agency. That's what we're hired to do. But when they actually become clients of ours, we can help them build sales teams. We can help them with email marketing. We can help them with content. We can help them with a lot more than what you actually offer. Exactly. Because because of the other businesses, mm. I have all these people in place. Yeah. Um. So, yeah, in terms of where I see myself, you know, I always joke, you know, when I'm 30, I'm pretty confident I'll be at 100 M's. Um, and I think at that point, I'll probably go off social media. Because uh, to be honest, I don't really like it. Um, you know, I, uh, I actually put this on my story the other day. At a billion, I always joke I'm gonna fake my own death. Mm. Um, yeah, I don't know. I and think just ghost off the plenty of earth. <laughs> yeah, I think I probably just want a very like private life because I have an intensely public life. And you'd probably end up buying your own island and making a house and everything like that. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I'm in the moment. I'm I'm looking at buying a not a one where we produce, but I'm actually in in the process of uh, buying a farm in Mexico. No, seriously. Uh, self-sustaining, yeah. So, I don't know, I'm a bit of a... Uh, uh, yeah, I'm definitely not a... Spontaneous decision. Yeah, I'm very... I'm very weird in, in certain ways. <laughs> I think uh, earlier on in the podcast, we mentioned about the fact that you were going to go to Dubai. Mm. So, I'm really glad and fortunate that we can make this happen just before you go. Mm. And to the people who message me saying, no, you ain't going to make it happen. You're going to Dubai. <laughs> nice, mate. <laughs> anyway, so, why Dubai? Why are you moving? Because you've been brought up here your whole life. You keep saying that you love this city, especially over to the Garden of Friends, saying you love the city of London. Yeah. London's well, the best city on earth. It so really is. If it's the best city on earth, why would you want to move? I, you know, I mentioned this to you. I don't, I don't like the way, I don't like the direction it's going. And uh, obviously everyone is um, allowed their, uh, everyone's entitled to their own opinion. Um, you know, I look at the way that Italy is, France is, with all of the um, mandatory uh certificates mm. um mandatory certificates for a uh, certain yeah i don't think we can mention it because, yeah i was yeah. about to say for a certain thing that's floating around um you know uh a jib jab i think that's fine i don't think that'll flag anything uh so yeah a little a uh, little jib jab certificate um and uh it breaks every single fucking nuremberg code ever um it's unethical it's immoral it's disgusting and one of the sad things is you know i'm leaving london but london's fully open now no masks this that and um you know for my e-commerce brand like i, I told you we produce masks mm. and the day after we launched them i literally took it down and you know that was multiple multiple five figures you know in stock they're like that was literally like uh, anyway I, I forget specifically how much but anywhere from like 40 60k in stock that that's just lost money, right? So I really wish masks work, but they don't. It doesn't take a genius to figure it out. I really wish that, you know, everything the government doing is in your best intentions on these pharmaceutical companies, but you really going to trust Pfizer? Do we want to bring up their track record? Um, and I mean, a four-year-old could figure this out, you know, and as I said, I wish I wasn't so well-researched on this topic. And, um, you know, I wish I wasn't so outspoken. You know, last year I made, in September, I made a, video talking about how this whole thing's a fucking scam and it was an hour and 45 long video with 72 references citing every single claim that I made actually my, my buddy Richard he was the one who's you know was really came in hot with the research um and uh yeah I've been very outspoken about it you know I lost my uh, blue tick on uh, Instagram because of uh violating community guidelines because I, I kept posting so much about uh I said it really doesn't take a genius to figure out this thing has nothing to do with the virus and everything to do with tyrannical control so i just don't want to be a part of a country that that does that and you know if i go to dubai and dubai mandates that sort of stuff by the way as i said for me it's the fucking easiest thing on earth like to, to get a 
fake certificate it takes two seconds. Like, it doesn't take... There, there's loads of loopholes. There's, 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 there's loads of Instagram stories and, of people and, and, saying, and, if you want this, message me. And yeah, and here, here's the other thing. Just remember, right? And by the way, you know, I th uh, people... It, it's funny because people... Because when I post about this stuff, people go, oh, you're coming from a very privileged place. And to me, it's like... And, you know, maybe they mean financially. It's like, well, go fuck yourself. Me and my mom were on government benefits. And my mom actually worked as a receptionist for the NHS. So um, I'm so sorry that, you know, I spent the last you know, maybe not uh, specifically on my business, but outside, of that, I'm so sorry I spent the last seven years working my fucking ass off, sacrificing everything to get to a point where, yes, I don't have to follow the rules and I never will, you know? And then people say, oh, but you're very, um, you're coming, speaking from a very privileged place because, you know, you're healthy. Last year, I had a chronic autoimmune condition that I had the most expensive doctors on earth tell me that you'll never be able to solve. Um, literally, someone called psoriasis. There's like 2% of the population that has it. Except for me, all over my body like insane like it was t literally fully covered and um you know if it keeps going for a while you end up getting something called uh, uh psoriatic arthritis um so basically if it, you know it kept going that way within mm. 10 15 years i'd be in a wheelchair yeah so i was actually in the highest risk category so while all this stuff was going on um i was the highest risk category and i would have never let anyone into my house if they're wearing a mask uh, that's a rule of mine um i you know, as I said, I but have... You wouldn't let them in. No chance. If they wasn't? No, if, if they were. If they was wearing it? If they were. You not allowed in my house. Why? Because it's a symbol of evil. Like, it's... If they worked, and if they worked, and this was actually about a virus, then let, yeah. Let me ask you a question, yeah, because you seem like an avid believer of this. Without saying it in a way that could risk my channel being deleted... <laughs> <laughs> Do you believe there ever was such a thing? Um, or do you it, think there's a whole... So it's it, it's never been isolated. Yeah. That I'm, I'm not sure, right? Mm. That I'm not sure. And it, I really have to dive more deeply into it. There's certain stuff that I know for a fact is... Did you have it? Um, it well, technically, yes. Okay. I guess I was... If you're asking me if I had a positive, yes. Yeah. At one point I did. Yeah. And I was in the gym earlier that morning. So that tells you everything you need to know. Yeah. yeah like... Yeah. You know what happens when you get the flu? You you can't get out of bed, right? So, you know, whatever fucking happened to just like listening to your body. But anyways, you know, if you're asking me, does it this thing exist? Um, you know, they're in Canada right now. There's actually a place in Canada called uh, uh, Alberta. And um, the they actually just stopped all mandates for everything. There's no lockdowns, no mass. And they were one of the most intense about it, like the strictest, most tyrannical. The reason that they had to drop it is because someone got a fine for $1,200, disputed it, and long story short, through you know uh, a longer story in a myriad of different ways, they actually ended up coming up against the Canadian government. What was the fine for? Uh, breaking uh, lockdown rules. Okay, yeah. And he goes, he was representing himself, he goes, if you can prove that it's ever been isolated outside of a PCR test, which is the fucking biggest scam on earth, and you've got the creator, Carrie Mullis himself saying, hey, anything above 28 cycles of viral RNA is junk data. What do we do? We do 35 to 45. You know, which is why even someone like myself, I've gone on a positive and a negative in the same day. Explain to me how that works. Yeah. But anyways, <laughs> um, the reason that this uh, place doesn't do any mandates anymore is because the, get this, the Canadian government was not able to prove that it's ever been isolated because it hasn't, <laughs> right? So if you're asking, you know, does it, I don't, that is, I don't know, you know, and I don't want to give an opinion on something I don't know. Uh, I do wonder why the Canadian government itself wasn't able to, you know, uh, provide any evidence that it has been isolated. Um, but I can tell you certain stuff for a fact. Uh, the masks don't work. Uh, you've got someone like, Ant uh, you know, Dr. Fauci in 2019 who literally makes a, a video or, or sorry, uh, literally uh, released a report that the 2018 Spanish flu was caused by masks and yeah, that thing, okay, yeah. right? Um, so yeah, you know, uh, without risk of getting uh, this video demonetized, um, I don't like the way the UK is going. Well, actually, funnily enough, that's the thing that makes me sad is because like the, out of all the countries, the UK is the best. Mm. Man, there's like rallies and protests of like a million, million and a half people. Obviously, you know, the government and BBC will never cover it, but like... You, I'm so proud of, you know, like I said, I don't consider myself Russian because I moved here when I was four. And I also don't consider myself British, you know, but I guess like I have so much like uh, 
I have a lot of like, I oh, man, I fucking love, I love the UK. Like I, I've always. Uh, uh, you, you need to experience outside of London. Yeah. I, I, how many, aside from going abroad, have you been around the UK? Yeah, of course, tons. Where? Yeah. Um, uh, I mean, uh, Bath, Birmingham, Manchester. Oh, uh, you've, been, you've been around then. Yeah, no, you still love around. all those cities as well? Huh? You still love all those cities as well? 100%. I, I love British people. Mm. Like, and by the way, like this is coming from someone who has a 78% US audience. And I say this to US people all the time. I'm like, you guys are so funny because like, like man like u.s people think they have the best country on it it's the biggest shithole i've ever seen you know and i and you I've know i've never been to the u.s not much special there um you know and of course you know there are some sorry to all the american people watching it's funny because I, I unfortunately i sound american <laughs> but um i just love man i love britain like i love british people i love the spirit like you know um and it makes me you know really sad to leave um but as I said, it this is kind of back in January. I made this decision, and back then, you know, it was full. You mm. know, everything was shut down. This, that. Oh, in Dubai? Uh, um, no, in London, in UK. I think Dubai was as well, wasn't it? No, no. It, I mean, ever since I think May, they they've never done one. No, they haven't done one, but they've had places that have been shut and uh, things that you can't do out there. If yeah, but I mean, you compare like point is you could still go to a restaurant. Okay, maybe you know the club shut down at like yeah. you know twelve rather than three a.m. Oh, okay. right, but it's not as you know. Like I remember at a certain point they were like, if you leave your city, you will be fined. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah. I remember, and I was on a flight the next morning. <laughs> I was like, people are such idiots. They follow the rules, you know. Um, and I'm you know I'm all for following the rules if it's ethical and moral. But if you follow the rules and it's unethical and moral, you are the problem. Um, and as I said, this is coming from someone who loves you know i don't know if uh, the other word will flag it so we'll just say the shutdowns i love it dude nine months a year i told you nine months a year i don't drink i don't drink caffeine i don't even have sugar you know i do this thing uh that i call monk mode you know so i stay at home and i work 14 hour days you know so i do what i always do except it's great because no one else is doing anything fun so i have no fear of missing out yeah and i said because of all this money printing i've made insane amounts like i've always done well but the last 18 months have been a lot, lot better than I could have ever imagined. Um, so this is someone who's benefited from all this stuff. And I'm still so outspoken. And I just wonder how people have their livelihood, their businesses, everything stripped away from them, their their liberties, and like they're just accepted. So um, yeah, you know, uh, I get people asking me, they're like, yeah, but how do you explain, you know, my family member and this, that, like, it very well may exist, no, the, but, you know, but here's the thing, we can speak opinions all day long. Fact, it has the same death rate as the flu. That is a fact. And by the way, as I said, when you have the flu, if 17 days later you have a heart attack, you died from a heart, heart attack. Here, if 27 days later you, you die from a heart attack and you've had a positive. You died from that. There's no question. They don't look into it. Yeah. Explain to me how that makes any sense. Yeah, I know, I know. Right? And even with all these inflated numbers, it still is on par with the flu. Look at the CDC's own numbers. So am I saying that there's not something out there? I don't know. And there very well could be. And there's, I know there's people who are sick and ill. And that is, I'm not going to dispute that. If, you know, someone tells me, oh, my family members, like, I'm not going to dispute the fact that there's pain and hardship and there's health issues. And I don't know what it is, yeah. right? But the government's response is not for your benefit. They're not there to help you. People need to realize the government is not your friend. They're not there to help you. And they never have. You can look back decades and decades. They've, they've never been there to help you. It's not in your fucking best interest. So as I said, very easily I could get a fake certificate and this and that. Very easily. And, you know, I've never followed a lockdown rule and I never will. Right? And if Dubai becomes tyrannical, then I'm leaving. And that's actually why I got my Mex Mexican residency. Because thing, <laughs> things are quite good there. Uh, and if Mexico is shit, then I'll... So Keep you going. got the Dubai residency and Mexican residency. Yeah, and I'm about to get a. Uh, I'm also going to get a Georgian passport, uh, diplomatic. Um, so what do you do? What would you do? Just just a random one. If the whole world was following the way that you know, UK is going to go, France, Italy, uh, move to a forest. <laughs> yeah, I mean, dude, I'm I hear that like, is the point when you create your own country, dude. I'm stubborn, and I know 99 percent of people will be like, dude, just what, what's the big deal in putting on a a mask and I totally get it I know I'm so stubborn with this stuff but I I just have there's certain morals and principles that like I don't know I told you from day one I always knew I'm just gonna do it my way 
and it gets me in trouble a lot um but i don't care whatever like i, I don't want to sell my soul to the devil so that you know has led you to the position that you are in today so yeah you know and then dubai um you know i, lo- I was looking at a few different places italy um because obviously the thing is I'm, I'm gonna leave the uk and go through this massive change i want to be compensated for it in the form of tax savings um so yeah you know i was looking at italy they have like a flat 100k a year uh tax scheme for um uh for uh expats uh, so i was like sick i can move to italy and pay like flat 100k a year that's amazing awesome i'm moving to italy but as i said you know i don't like the way that they're going um so yeah dubai will be my base and you know who knows maybe it'll be a horrendous decision and i'm gonna you know regret it and uh get sick of all the artificial everything because you know me i you know i live in even where i live in london you know yeah. you know i don't have a car because I, I live in knightsbridge and i walk everywhere and i like culture and i like beautiful buildings and this and that and dubai is not that at all uh and who knows you know maybe i end up hating it but <laughs> and yeah this, it's a very strong possibility but uh in my position right now it feels like the right move um so i guess only time will tell fair enough um so before we wrap this podcast up i want to ask you a question don't have to answer it what does your tax bill look like <laughs> Because obviously the only reason why I'm asking this yeah. is because obviously Dubai is zero percent. Yeah, for sure. And here, okay, instead of asking what's your tax bill look like, what's the percentage bracket that you got to pay? Well, of course. I'm, I mean, as I said, this year I'll probably do. I mean, we'll we'll totally see depending on investments as well as I said. Um, you know, because a large part of my portfolio is in cryptocurrencies. Mm. Um, but I think this year I'll probably do 10, 10 mil pre tax. Um, so one of the uh, very lucky things uh, in the UK, you don't have to pay any exit tax. So that saves me a lot of money. Yeah. But then again, capital gains is, is pretty low. But um, yeah, if you're asking me what tax bracket, I mean, I mean of course, I'm in the highest one. Yeah, so, <laughs> I <could> uh, tell. <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's crazy. And yeah, yeah, you'll be living, be able to earn all of it in Dubai. Yep. So it will be a good little saving. And uh, I mean, like either way, I, I, I will not raise my kids in Dubai. You know, 100%. You wouldn't no. raise them then? No. So no. where would you raise your kids? I, I, I have full intention of returning back to UK as long as, it's um i feel aligned with where it's at um you know i need to join you out in dubai vlog it a bit of the lifestyle and probably possibly do a part two there there we go yes. yeah dude we'll do it in the, uh, the new apartment I told when you. are you going uh i get the keys to my place actually tomorrow but i won't be there for another three weeks so probably right at the end of august yeah um, i might be going there mid-september so if you don't want to see a part two make sure you let us know no, they, they don't, they're like, this dude is so fucking insane. <laughs> yeah, they're going to want to see it. Exactly. That's what I'm like. Let's hear more conspiracy theories. <laughs> it's one of the one of them ones. Uh, but I hope you all enjoyed this podcast. The main thing is comment your feedback and your thoughts. Let me know what you thought. And once again, I want to thank you very much for making this happen. No, oh, man. Yeah. Thanks. I appreciate much. you coming on. Until next time, guys, I'll catch you on the next episode of CEO Cost. I'm so grateful. Challenge me. Subscribe. Do everything you need to do, yeah?